So next up, uh, we've got Andy Chapman. Um, he's from a culture change agency, and um, he's going to talk about something very, very deep. <laughs> so, um, well, I'm not sure about that, we'll see. I will uh, let him actually pay me then, okay? Thank you very much. So you just have to figure out which is Okay, no problem. Right. Oops, how do I go back? That wasn't a good start, was it? It's okay. There we are. Um, good evening everyone, I'm Andy Chapman, I'm co-founder of Change the Conversation, uh, we're a cultural change and innovation agency, and I'd like to tell you a story tonight about the market economy, business, the state of the planet, and how we might make things better. Uh, these are kind of ideas which are sort of a bit of a work in progress, so I'd value your, your thoughts afterwards if you have them. Um, perhaps I'll the, the first line is have to take it out of Okay, so shall I do that? Yeah, there we go. So our story starts with the market economy itself. Um, we're all part of it, and we know the obvious benefits it brings. It brings us a dazzling array of choice as consumers of goods and services, even in the most everyday cir uh, circumstances. You want a coffee, sir? No, I want a skinny latte, super hot with extra bubbles and a side twist of cinnamon. Coming right up, sir. The intertwined forces of competition, human ingenuity and ambition mean that the market economy is also a phenomenal engine for innovation in products and services. The first eyeglasses were made in Italy in the 13th century, allowing the wearer to read hand-copied manuscripts. Roll forward a few hundred years and Google Glass allows us to record everything we see and do and share it with millions of others. It also creates performance incentives. In feudal times, if you were a member of the aristocracy, you had servants to do most things for you. If you weren't, you had a life that was nasty, brutish and short, no matter how hard you worked. The market economy allows for greater alignment between personal capabilities, ambition, hard work and material rewards. And perhaps the most useful function that the market economy uh, performs is as a mechanism for allocating productive resources through the trade of goods and services. The prices that attach to all trades serve as indicators of where there is excess demand or supply for something and also what the relative values are that we collectively attach to different things. However, the market economy also has some serious flaws. One of them is what economists call externalities. These are byproducts of economic activity that are not adequately reflected in the price mechanism. Deforestation is one such thing. The value of the forest that's cut down to extract minerals, for example, is not reflected in the price that we pay as consumers for the products that result. Another externality is pollution. Most of us are horrified when we see pictures like this, and yet they're all too common in many parts of the world. For example, there are now huge patches of plastic waste floating around the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, which have a detrimental effect on the marine environment. How do the costs of this pollution get factored into the prices for plastic bottles? They don't. Another seemingly inevitable characteristic of an unfettered market economy is a hugely unequal distribution of income and wealth in society. In the US, for example, the top 1% own 35% of the nation's wealth, and the top 20% own 85%. You can argue about the ethics of such a situation, but you can't argue that such inequalities add to social friction. And the real irony is that the rising levels of material affluence in recent decades don't seem to be making us much, if at all, any more content. This graph shows the growth of US GDP per capita versus the level of subjectively assessed happiness in the population, and I think it speaks for itself. And the malaise is visible in the business world too. The CIPD in the UK reported in a survey in February that only 35% of staff felt positively engaged with their work and with the values and purposes of the organisations they work for. In large organisations, the figure drops to 31%. And perhaps the greatest concern is the inherent instability of the market economy and the businesses that form a major part of it. The propensity of humanity to get caught up in speculative herd-like behaviour is well documented and has resulted in innumerable asset price bubbles and collapses, from the tulip fever in 17th century Holland to the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008. However, when all is said and done, the market economy is just a tool, a human invention for facilitating trade. In and of itself, I'd argue, it's neither good nor bad, so the problems with it must have their roots somewhere else. I'd like to suggest that one place is the, to look is the lack of diversity in the values, viewpoints and policies of our global leaders. 
And with this homogenous view of what our policy priorities should be comes a kind of lazy, well, that's just how things are, uh, that ends up as being a sort of half-hearted, shoulder-shrugging, apologetic defence of business as usual. And it denies the possibility of effective change uh, or a finding a way of doing business differently that will give us a chance of tackling the deficiencies of the economy. I think that... Oh! I'm afraid you're deprived of my lovely chart, so I'll have to describe it. <laughs> this is a chart which I've kind of invented myself, showing on the one axis uh, what uh, effect people have on the business and what uh, effect business have on people. The point of it being that there are a number of stakeholders that have lots of that are affected by business but have no influence on it. So I think we need a diverse uh, business ecology. Uh, we need a greater diversity of views, experiences, talents, concerns and values to be involved in how our businesses are run than presently the case. We need business decisions to reflect many more things than just how will this affect our next quarter's earnings. And if someone says that they inevitably will, oh well that's just naive, I think that it's important that we develop the habit of questioning and challenging the way things are, as a child might. Why does inventing and trading things mean that we have to ruin the natural systems that support us? Why is business only about what directors and shareholders want? And so on. Mm -hmm. While we're doing this, of course, we need to retain, if we can, the many things about the market economy that do work well. It is a high effect, highly effective way of organising trade that satisfies our material needs. It can serve as a powerful mechanism for allocating resources. It does allow for an individual to apply their drive, ingenuity and talents to amazing effects, and so on. In my view, a key ingredient to balancing these possibly competing ends is to make sure that all of the main stakeholders in business are afforded a real voice in the dialogue about what its purpose, objectives and ways of operating should be. We need to recapture the sense that in our individual choices and actions, we need to be aware and to take account of our wider impact on society and the world around us. So in the dialogue involving all the main stakeholders, uh, what kind of issues might we want to discuss? These are three questions which I think it would be interesting to explore in such a conversation. I'm going to have to my slides, I It's my bad, I, it's the Mac. It's oh, right. Yes. <laughs> and then finally, I'd like to add, uh, add, end with a suggestion. Why don't we, uh, to be, begin the process of democratising business and the market economy, by requiring public companies to hold an annual public meeting that's open to all stakeholders, and not just an annual general meeting for shareholders? Thanks very much for listening, and if you uh, would like to talk to us more about these issues, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much.